What is the point? That is what must be borne in mind. Sometimes the point is really who wants what. Sometimes the point is what is right or kind. Sometimes the point is a momentum, a fact, a quality, a voice, an intimation, a thing said or unsaid. Sometimes it's who's at fault or what will happen if you do not move at once. The point changes and goes out. You cannot be forever watching for the point or you lose the simplest thing, being a major character in your own life. But if you are, for any length of time, custodian of the point, in art, in court, in politics, in lives, in rooms, it turns out there are rear guard actions everywhere. To see a thing clearly, and when your vision of it dims or when it goes to someone else, if you have a gentle nature, keep your silence. That is lovely. Otherwise, now and then, a small foray is worthwhile, just so that being always complacently thoroughly wrong does not become the safest position of them all. The point has never quite been entrusted to me. Hey there, and welcome to the Books of Some Substance podcast. This is Nick, and today David, Nathan, and myself are chatting about Renata Adler's 1976 novel, Speedboat. Broken up into many short journalistic vignettes, the book is very much a product of the 1970s, both in artistic structure and in its wry social commentary. Much like the start and stop rhythms of the novel, we start and stop our way through trying to figure out exactly what it is about this book that readers enjoy. Is it good that Adler's writing style has been compared to that of a DJ? Is the book funny? Has David or Nathan ever actually laughed or cried at a book? Or more importantly, does Nathan even possess tear ducts? We hope you dig the speedboat-esque twists and turns. For is it art that imitates life, or life that imitates art? We have no idea. Enjoy. I guess now we are custodians of the point. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what is the point? What was the point of that paragraph about the point? <laughs> yeah, that, that's my question. <laughs> I, I think the line in the middle of it that says you cannot be forever watching for the point or you lose the simplest thing is a hint at the entire structure of this book? <laughs> well, I guess. Because do you feel like the narrator is a character in this book? I mean, I hate to like always assume that the narrator is the, sim- is the same as the author, but I kind of feel like maybe it is. Is that like rookie literary analysis? No, no. I, I mean, like, do you feel that the narrator, whether or not it's the author, is irrelevant to me? I mean, is the narrator a character? Like, does in the she book? have, is she characterized? Does she have characterizations? Yes. You have like, if you keep looking for the point, you'll lose the idea that you'll be a major character in your life. The whole thing feels so distant to me. You don't even feel like the character or the theoretical character is participating as a character in her own life that she's documenting in these little vignettes. Is that sort of where you're going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's moments, obviously, where her life is what you would expect of a character. Like, there, there's emotion, reason, points to talking about something. But there's a lot of just observation and recording, almost like a stenographer. Yeah. But without really leading <laughs> to anything. Um, I highlighted quite a fair amount in this book, and she kind of addresses that very topic earlier, like at the very beginning of the book. Mm. And it kind of seems like, well, this might speak a little bit to what you're saying and also the structure of the book and maybe who this character is a little bit. But this is like right at the beginning on page 10. For a while, I thought I had no real interests, no theater, concerts, museums, stamp collections, only ambitions and ties to people of a certain intensity, different sorts of people. I was becoming a ward healer of the emotional life. Now the ambitions have drifted after the interests. I have lost my sense of the whole. I wait for events to take a form. I remember somebody saying, you've got to steep yourself in things. So I steeped myself in thrillers, commercials, news magazines. The same person used to write tepid and arguable all over the margins of what our obituary writers wrote. I now think tepid and arguable several times a day. Tell you what, I thought tepid several times throughout this book. (laughs) I, I didn't connect to this at all. I really had high expectations because so many people praised this novel, and I just felt nothing. Let's work with that, right? So I've been thinking about this book off and on, and I think I feel pretty similar. Mm. Um, The 
the structure of it and the fact that it doesn't really amount to anything, I think makes it pretty easy to forget. But at the same time, whenever somebody reads a quote, I kind of like it. And so there's a lot of these, I mean, they're all these very short vignette things, but she has a lot of these, I wouldn't even say one-liners, but just very succinct, compact observations about just the mundane bullshit of academic departments and cocktail parties and the super rich and the cultural intelligentsia. And I was waiting for it to amount to a thing, and it never did. And I think that's why it ultimately feels like a, I don't know, a balloon letting some air out. But I am surprised that some of those moments are still pretty cool to me. I mean, I loved how she took down like some of like the arguments over who gets to have Dostoevsky and like what <laughs> academic department. Like it's super banal, but I feel like we're still doing that as a society like over and over and over again. But if you're looking for a thing that emotionally connects or has some sort of plot arc or really some central thesis, I don't think there's yeah, one here. I think I feel also kind of similarly. I I think, Nick, you, you summed it up pretty well. There's a lot of, I mean, the book itself is made up of short anecdotes, almost aphoristic anecdotes that are frequently less than a page long that kind of flow one into another, but don't really connect to each other. So as a whole, it's like, what is this? What does this add up to? Even though, you know, individually, I think I could pick this up. And it's like, oh, that'd be a funny scene in a movie. Oh, I kind of want to take that for something else. And I can kind of see somebody opening this up and getting that out of it. If you're, if you want to do a, you know, a period screenplay in the 1970s and you want to like s- see some insights into <laughs> little interactions, you know, there's, there's lots of material here to kind of give you a, a little glimpse a little a little peephole into what life might have been like but you know the the fact that it doesn't that there's not really an arc i mean i guess you could say hey maybe the the arc is that she ends up pregnant at the end but i, I wouldn't call that you know, an this arc. book was wr- written in what 1970 <laughs> early 1970s six I believe, or so published it like, in I think it was written in like 74 mm-hmm. copyright 71 actually so it was it was written at the beginning of the 70s and you think of like what what art and culture was like at that time and this modernism and like early postmodernism and the destruction of narratives in film. And I'm no expert here, but that I, I would imagine that that's what she's writing within. So yeah, I'm kind of rambling here. The, did y'all read the afterword? Cause she talks about this a little bit. And I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. The, where they, they compare it to sort of the work yeah. of a DJ. Yeah. Right? Or that it's, it's proto Twitter. Yeah, which does not help its case, in my <laughs> which opinion. Which is a, an unsale <laughs> yeah. in my book. <laughs> but you're right. To me, it, it felt like the collage of some dilettante's diary. There, there were occasional insights and occasional uh, quips, but there was also a lot of... It's like someone writing in a stripped-down Hemingway-esque prose. He said, oh, if I just keep it simple and maybe add like a twist at the end of this line... It'll somehow make it profound or engaging. And occasionally it was. Occasionally it really was. And I think the two passages you read hint at that. But those, to me, were far and few between. There's a lot of just... And I don't know if it's meant to be, like, like a joke. Let me see if I can find... There's just the way she opens and closes each of these paragraphs sometimes. Like, is this... Like making fun of itself? There's one paragraph that opens. We have all, of course, had childhoods. Like that's the opening sentence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Like that the passage that you mentioned near the end. Oh, where she gets pregnant and she's talking about how everything can be a hostage, maybe. Oh yeah. Do you know do yeah, you remember this actually, passage? Actually, I've got that one. Like the idea I, of hostages I, is very deep. Becoming pregnant is taking See, right hostage. There. Is that supposed to be funny? The idea like, is of it making fun of itself is very deep. Are we supposed to like this voice, or are we supposed to like I, so, kind of see, think I, I of it? I don't, as, I don't really feel I mean, like it's it takes itself it's very definitely seriously. pretty wry. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's meant to be on that edge. Yeah. So like uh, the character comes from the background of like private schools and like a ton of education, right? And then gets mixed, not mixed up, but is sort of simultaneously straddling worlds of journalism 
in New York City and the uber rich and war reporting and stuff like that. And you just feel that these are super like wide ends of the spectrum. And it's almost like trying to make sense of that and seeing how almost ludicrous a lot of this stuff is. Mm. Which I, I really like the idea of that. And like I said, there's sentences in here that I do find to be kind of great. Like when she, she talks about like the University of California, Santa Cruz, and like there's a group of students there that are protesting in favor of, you know, some group that doesn't give a shit about them yeah. and wants them to like just go away. But the students don't know where to put their protest energy. <laughs> I was just like, oh god, that's so good. And yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I found myself gently amused through the whole thing, and I think even that paragraph about hostages. I, yeah, yeah, we can read it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it's not a long one. I'll read. Uh, it'll be quick. Becoming pregnant is taking a hostage. As is running a pawn shop, being a bank, receiving a letter, taking a photograph, or listening to a confidence. Every love story, every commercial trade, every secret, every matter in which trust is involved is a gentle transaction of hostages. Everything is, to a degree, in the custody of every other thing. Blackmail, kidnapping, then, are among the extreme violations of the deal. Anyway, I seem to be about to have Jim's child, at least. I think I will. And the thing is, I haven't mentioned it to Jim. And that kind of, like, abrupt, you know, pseudo high thinking about hostages to the confessional i haven't told jim that i'm pregnant with his child uh kind of amuses me and she kind of does that throughout the whole thing it's just kind of this like blurring of maybe this is what nick was just saying but this kind of like blurring of all of this stuff and attempting to i mean i don't think it attempts a whole lot i think it just gets into this rhythm yeah and I guess I do find some enjoyment in how it's a bit judgmental. I mean, she's she's basically criticizing a lot of different groups in a lot of different directions, but and kind of in a in like a funny, r- cynical, wry wink kind of way. It's very yeah blase yeah. about everything. Yeah, it's also kind of self-referential too. Yeah. Like she's aware of her own stuff, but I also think that like coming from you know, a character who's a female journalist in the 70s who, you know, she mentions like going to this uh, private school where all the women are basically studying these you know, like, you know, high arts and skills. And then basically every single one of them who goes into the world is asked the same question, which is, do you know how to type? <laughs> yeah. And so part of me thinks there is kind of a badass level of this woman who's probably just dealt with some pretty like stereotypical like 1970s, like, oh, you're a woman, you should be a typist. And she's just kind of like, fuck that. I make fun of all of you and I control this narrative. And so that's that's like my positive if I was trying to argue for this book. But still, it's hard for it to be more than just a bunch of quips. Yeah. There, I, I guess, I mean, you kind of summed, <laughs> summed up exactly how I feel. Like there's there's the occasional quip and there's moments where I think, oh, maybe maybe this is happening. Maybe this is happening. There's just a lot happening that is not particularly engaging. There's a lot of, she introduces a character, or often it'll be, the man said this, and there's just like a quote, and not, nothing feels very connected, and I'm not, and people say, oh, it's a, you know, this is a book of the time, and it shows how disconnected we are, and all these other things. It's like, yeah, I guess that I, works. I feel like, it, to me, it kind of suffers from what a lot of classic 70s films suffers from it's like because it doesn't believe in anything except that it doesn't believe in anything it's hard to care now it's like i see how that was relevant at the time it's like you had nixon and you had the vietnam war and it just seemed like structures were collapsing and there was nothing to replace it and it's just like this period of like there's nothing to replace our narratives but because of that it's hard to connect with it on an on an emotional level like intellectually i can kind of like get it but even intellectually i I don't it doesn't sustain that and and maybe it suffers from me being both stupid and not having enough time to really like reread and sit with it because i i I literally finished it this morning in in a panic (laughs) race to, to to get ready so that might play a part 
in me. I didn't find it that engaging intellectually. I, I, I don't need to engage with things emotionally either. So I just finished reading. I know, Nick, you've read The Tunnel by William Gass, which mm-hmm. is just this ridiculously ex- bizarre, very experimental novel. And yet I was engaged with it almost entirely, even in the most horrible way sometimes. So it doesn't, like, I don't need to connect emotionally with every book I read, but I want to at least, I needed something else and I don't know what it is and I can't put my finger on it exactly. I don't know. Did, did you find connections? So let, let me, let's just go like something simple, like in terms of the chapters, they each have the, I guess they're chapters, but there's these sections labeled like brownstone, castling, quiet. Mm-hmm. Did you find any thread that connects these things? Did did it? Did you? Were you trying to? I just gave up trying. You gave up. Okay. I mean, I think my own either shortcomings or style of reading is that as I'm reading, I just accept that like I'm cool with whatever I get out of it. Mm. Like I know a lot of people are are seeking the the key or the decoder ring or what this means and what this doesn't or does or doesn't mean. And I just kind of have abandoned that because I don't know. I'm doing it in my free time. I either like it or I don't, which I think is actually, so it's good that you bring this up. And also Nathan, your comment about the seventies and sort of what art was then to me, I think it's relevant in thinking about this in the period in which 1974 Thomas Pynchon's gravity rainbow gravity's rainbow won the national book award, which is weird to think that anybody really ever (laughs) fucking read that like in a contemporary type of setting. And so this to me is is just as like, I don't know, directionless, but in the complete opposite mm. style, right? So Gravity's Rainbow is just like, I'm going to throw a thousand percent of everything at a wall and see what sticks and what doesn't stick and no characters have to be important. They just show up and disappear, but it's super gratuitous. I mean, think of like 70s music. It's just all about what's the biggest thing that we can do. Like literally like Pink Floyd had records that like have... 28 minute like noise tracks on them and they were somehow like a popular band like that shit just doesn't happen now right we have too much too much easy art to access so gravity's rainbow is like yes is close to the edge <laughs> i would agree with that okay and so this i i to me felt a little counter counterculture doing sort of a similar thing and honestly the person i think who did it better has the quote on the back of this Barthelme, right yeah. Um, and then I also was was hoping or waiting that this sort of attached its breaks and vignettes in a way that David Markson basically fine tuned mm. with Wittgenstein's Mistress and then his uh, author reader novels that he got into, which are really just these tiny one to three sentence things that after a while there's a rhythm to it and it ends up with some sort of I wouldn't even say plot development, but there's a there's a uh, an art to it that allows you to attach yourself. Yeah. And this, I thought, I mean, who knows who read what, but maybe it's a weird, not finely tuned precursor to that. So I, again, I find art, these arguments for why I think I should be into this <laughs> <laughs> and I could pitch it, but I don't think I would, would, uh, you know, be throwing this book around as a thing that you're supposed to be reading. It just feels kind of fun sometimes, but pretty, pretty forgetful. So we should all just go listen to Yes right now. <laughs> I don't even know. Is it Barth- Bartholme? I say Bartholme. Okay. Is it is it Renata? Renata Adler? I don't know. I don't we know. didn't work on I didn't know he, uh, he had a blurb on What, what did he write? Um, his main things are the groups of stories. I think it's 40 stories and 60 stories. They're just like these really, really bare bones. Like still, I mean, postmodern-y, but I guess it all depends on how you apply the term. But just like... I don't know, lots of like unattributed dialogue that I feel like was picked up by a lot of those kind of postmodern authors later. But just, I don't know, if this is abrupt and jagged, I feel like he did that more, but better. And also feels very 70s. He makes a lot of cultural references to the time as well. Mm -hmm. What you ended on there, Nick, was that a lot of it is forgettable. Like without flipping through it, it's really hard for me to remember or hold on to anything besides... There's like a few one-liners that I really enjoyed. There's one, the unhappiest people tend to get, bring comfort to the happiest people or something. Do you remember yeah, that there, Yeah. Oh, man. A... I can't even fully remember it now. <laughs> I remember a line like that. <laughs> but little things like that. And I also, speaking of like picking up patterns, 
Nathan, you kind of mentioned it, where she'll start a paragraph on an idea and seemingly sort of throw a wrench into that idea in the last two lines or even sometimes the last sentence. And I think sometimes it works really well. I think the maybe that kidnapping paragraph is actually grown on me since we started talking about it <laughs> but because I, I feel like it works better as a structured paragraph and for revealing the character to be someone you're maybe not supposed to not, not necessarily supposed to agree with or like or find her insightful <laughs> but but sometimes it works really well and i think other times it just it fails but it, it becomes a pattern yeah or at least it did for me pretty quickly within the first 30 or 40 pages. Like, okay, all right, I see what is happening now. And it it almost felt the narrator was, and maybe this is me projecting or something, I don't know, but it, it felt like trying to be, trying too hard to be witty in those moments. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a feeling of like, oh, I built this thing up and even if, even if it's only two paragraphs, I'm going to tear it down in an opposite way every time it, it almost yeah. seemed to me like it, it was just it was kind of like a program that she was running like it, <laughs> it wasn't even supposed to work every time because sometimes sometimes it does I, I, like i think the the hostage is when it does kind of work sometimes it just makes the whole thing less interesting but she does it so consistently it's i think i think maybe every single anecdote follows that same program almost, i think some, yeah. something that's uh, interests me about this. She only, she's only written two books, right? She wrote this one, and then some decades later wrote Pitch Black. She's wrote, written a lot of uh, nonfiction, criticism, okay. and nonfiction. But when she spoke about writing this book, she wanted to write something with plot, something sort of traditional and entertaining, and then found that she was incapable of doing that. Was that I think in the afterward? Was in the forward and the afterward. Because I, I, I read that before I started reading the book, but she talks about that in the end too, or in the afterward rather. And kind of the, I mean, she says, you know, the, so in the afterward, the author of the afterward refers to the, 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 she's like a DJ of these anecdotes. And she's like, that makes sense to me. Music, particularly music with melody, has direct access to the whole range of feelings, which strictly modernist or atonal music does not. Traditional classic fiction could also address that entire range of thought and feeling. Soap operas can reach it. But strict high modernist fiction tends to dismiss most appeals to emotion, sentiment, caring about characters and what happens to them as cheap as kitsch and stays in a chilly range. But I feel that even when she's talking about this work that, I mean, I guess got her fairly famous. There's some good testimonials in the back. She doesn't seem to take it especially seriously. It's kind of an accident. In that afterward, she even mentions that she tried to do something and she doesn't know if she actually succeeded. And then she says, oh, maybe in my other novel I did it well, but maybe not even then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a lot of writers tend to criticize their own work, which is fine. But it certainly makes it easy to agree <laughs> with her. <laughs> well, you know what they say. Well, you know, you can't win them all, the old bartender said. In fact, you can't win any of them. All right. I guess. <laughs> I tried, again, after I finished this book, I tried looking online because I was like, oh, a lot of people love this book. Let me let me see a couple of reviews to see what they say. And I found that a lot of people had a hard time actually defining. Even the person who writes this afterwards says, oh, the novel seems unstructured, but it's really deliberately structured in a way. And then they vaguely talk about how it really captures the essence of the 70s, which I think, Nathan, you actually made clear in my mind about the time but it just felt like a lot of people describing this book without actually telling me why it's good like they they kind of talked around it in a way that i just i i, uh, I, 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 I wonder say, i, I wonder if it's one of those things it's like <laughs> it just strikes a, just the right chord because she talks about in that in the afterward you know what she was trying to do was do a modernist piece that had feeling and it's i don't know that i really get that not that <laughs> yeah but maybe yeah. at the moment that it was published <laughs> Maybe, you know, for the for the people who were, you know, for the reading public, maybe it did do that. Maybe it was just enough emotion. Maybe it was just, maybe it gave you just enough glimpse into the author or the character. Maybe it was just loose enough, just wry enough. Maybe it just hit that chord at that time that people were like, yeah, it resonated. Oh, these were contemporary reviews based on its uh, 
republication by New York Review Book Classics. Mm -hmm. Because it was out of print for a long time, and then they republished this, I think, not that long ago, maybe within five, six years. Anyone know? Something like that? Somewhere in the teens. Yeah, somewhere in the teens. And that's when it started getting, at least from the few times I look at Twitter or go to independent bookstores or something back when I still lived in the States, like this book was everywhere and everyone talked about it. It was like, it was, it was a thing. It was an event, you know? Yeah. And and maybe it is that this is a sort of precursor or always remained a relevant critique of how scattered and cut up and brief we sort of process the world, which I guess you can make an argument for that, but maybe I'm too distant from that sort of life. I don't live in cities. I don't live in the U.S. anymore. I feel so removed from that sort of existence that it just doesn't feel doesn't feel like reality, which is a lot of people place that on this book. Although one reviewer actually talked of it as a surreal novel, which I agree with. I feel like it's 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 a very surreal experience to just be like dropped mm. into these moments. I mean, I would steal uh, slash borrow a comment from our reading group. We talked about this a couple of days ago. And so this is from from Tess, in case Tess is listening, I'm stealing this. But she mentioned that she was reading this in Dolores Park in San Francisco. And like something about sitting there as people walk through the park and utter their own comments that are just as banal and silly and absurd as the situations that are happening in these little anecdotes in Speedboat. Something like that connected that with her. Mm. Which makes sense to me, right? Like everybody here in the book is like, either highly educated or wealthy or, uh, you know, has some sort of kind of reasonable station in life, but they're all kind of, they're all drunks. They're all complaining. There's a thing about like writers don't actually write. They just what walk around and go through the trash or something. <laughs> I, I, that one was funny is. too. Who knows? Yeah. There's whole, I like, I enjoyed when she's talking about how the person thinks that she's an alcoholic, so she's going to go out to dinner, but she's not going to not drink because that's what an alcoholic would do. So therefore, she's settled on having to drink, but a medium amount and a drink that alcoholics wouldn't drink, which is ouzo or whatever, the, the, the Greek Greek drink, because that's not what alcoholics would drink. And that to me just like is some bullshit that you would overhear <laughs> from somebody walking by in San Francisco whose life is not hard. It's totally fine. They got like everything going for them and they're super hung up on this one just like mundane piece of nothing. And so uh, I can see what you could connect to in it. Um, Yeah, I think there's like a a self-awareness of the absurdity. Yeah. um, That this book taps into. Because you're also also talking about 70s Manhattan, right? Like there's just some some gnarly stuff as uh, in that time period. And I would also say like in parallel, I've been going back and for the first time reading uh, some of the Philip Roth, like early Zuckerman novels, mm-hmm. which touch on like, you know, 1970s, like literary uh, uh, Manhattan kind of culture stuff. And it made me realize that, again, I'm just, oh God, I'm fucking working so hard to try to pitch this book to myself. <laughs> I just can't get there. But I do think that a lot of like modern writing has to be of this certain style it's every like everybody read carver at some point and was like cool we got to write these slim sort of impactful stories and i feel like this book and honestly even more so those those philip roth books are just it's got this like energy like somebody's kind of vibrating from this ridiculousness that they're surrounded in in real life and they're trying to document it and it's not necessarily perfect but at least it's it, to me it feels a little more of trying to engage with that that energy or chaos around you versus now it's like go to an MFA program, write your slick prose, have it be accessible, have it be morally appropriate, have it address all of these things, and then we'll check that box and then we'll market you and then people will say it's great and then move on. And so part of me l- likes that there was some messiness that I mm. feel like doesn't make it through to the major publishers now. Yeah. You know, like we cut out stuff that makes us not feel good. We cut out stuff that, you know, has sentences that aren't written in the way that they're supposed to, like all that stuff. So again, same theme. I want <laughs> to argue a, for that's it. That's a good pitch. But this isn't the book to trans. <laughs> it's a good pitch. Yeah. And and it's good. you've made me appreciate that this book exists without having to actually like it. 
Yes, there you go. You should go through the podcast and just edit out every single time I try to argue for it. And then at the end, you go, <laughs> eh, but I don't like it. Yeah. Classic <laughs> Renata Adler. Classic. It's like what she does in her vignettes where she does a whole thing in the last two sentences. She undoes it. All right, then. Yeah, what else we got? I do think that there's it's there's a lot of pretty funny stuff. I think so. What's there? I, I, I kind of chuckled. A, I didn't even chuckle. I don't laugh. I don't laugh when, when I read. I read about this. <laughs> Does anyone actually laugh when they read? I've never laughed. I've never laughed uh, out loud. I I've snickered. Why? I snicker. I've smirked. What smirk is like? I was reading the something highest. on like the bus, and I could hardly hold it together. I can't think of what it was. Has a book ever made you cry? Do you know oh. what book made me cry? The Thousand Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoet by uh, uh, David, David Mitchell. Mitchell. It's a good book. I enjoyed that. I don't know if I've ever cried from a book. I also don't really cry in real life. Yeah. Yeah, mostly my reasons. face just hurts. <laughs> yeah. Your face just yeah, hurts. My, my, my back is sore a lot, so... I got that going for me, but no tears. <laughs> Your face hurts. What is that? Yeah, yeah I, I that don't comment? know what that means. Like I'm like, oh, From frowning. This this is when I should be crying. It's just like there's a a wall behind my eyes. So you try just, to cry, just, and then your face hurts to. from just excruciating <laughs> yeah. effort. I don't know. It's existential effort. So there's a Seinfeld on that where Jerry gets in touch with his feelings and then he's like, what is this salty <laughs> discharge? <laughs> oh, but sorry. Um, just after the hostages passage, let me just tell me what you think about this small paragraph. In any group of two or more, it seems somebody is on trial. Sometimes more than one person is on trial. Sometimes everyone is, but not for long. Under the law, a person can be said to plan alone or to plot alone, but not to conspire alone. There are other things, of course, no one can do alone. Be a mob or a choir or a regiment or elope. And it kind of carries on. I think Sounds it's accurate. funny. Why? Did you laugh, It's though? just silly. Like you, okay. you can't be a mob alone. That's funny. <laughs> you, you can't elope alone. That's, that's funny. It's not like, you know, belly laugh funny, but it's, uh, I don't know, just silly kind of wordplay. Not exactly wordplay. Language play. Okay. It's like the, okay. you know, it's the sound of one hand clapping. It's like, a, imagine what a mob of one is like. It's a zen it's cone. Funny. Imagine what it's like to elope by yourself. It's funny. See what you just said was funny. Yeah, I don't know. I I kind of and I'm I think I feel like I've been defending this book this whole podcast too. And and to be clear, I don't know that I would ever strongly recommend this book if somebody, except in the situation that I said, somebody's trying to write a amusing satire set in the 1970s, maybe with a dry sense of humor. I'd say, oh, you should pick this book up, read some of those anecdotes. Other than that, it's probably another book above this in the list. But the I, I she carries this tone that's kind of sometimes breaks through into actually being funny and sometimes it's just kind of a humorous way of carrying on is there a particular moment that you thought was funny (laughs) i kind of says the search to convince (laughs) david that this is funny well Um, nathan and i have already had a Disagreement about humor when we talked about Bo Burnham's oh, yeah, special. Yeah, like Bo Burnham's. Oh, is that, that you? Is and that me? not funny? I thought I it was thought hilarious. It was awful. <laughs> oh, one of the funniest <laughs> things the I've seen in a long time. Self-indulgent pieces of shit <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I haven't seen it. Probably won't because I don't watch anything current because I'm just too anti. Yeah. But I like where this is going. Outside of a couple of good songs, anyway, but that's another <laughs> discussion for another time. Nathan's well, found like the, we mentioned this earlier, the the quote about or the passage about writers. I often wonder about the people who linger over trash baskets at the corners of the city's sidewalks. One sees them day and night, young and old, well dressed in rags, often with shopping bags, picking over the trash. They pick out newspapers, envelopes. They discard things. I often wonder who they are and what they're after. 
I approach and cannot ask them. Anyway, they scurry off. Sometimes I think they are writers who do not write. That writers write is meant to be self-evident. People like to say it. I find it's hardly ever true. Writers drink, writers rant, writers phone, writers sleep. I have met very few writers who write at all. To me, that just feels like a cliche. Like, don't a lot of people make fun of writers for not writing? It just seems like a thing. Like a, uh, like a novel about an author who's having trouble writing. So they write a novel about it. And it's just a thinly veiled version of themselves. Yeah. Not that that's a Philip Roth <laughs> book that I'm reading right now that I still like. Not that that's a, a number of, I feel like a lot of those dudes have n those kind of novels. Yeah. And the thing is, I want to, I want to write, or <laughs> I want to write myself. I want to say that I dislike them, but there's something about the way they write it and the way it pops that it still works for me. It's just like intense navel gazing. And I think again, common theme, the navel gazing of this didn't really pop for me. I mean, it's just I, as navel gazing. Actually, but I don't. Like... I don't enjoy those navel gazing kind of writers writing about writing and how hard it is to write. And oh. I didn't find this to be navel gazing. I kind of this thought is... it was the opposite. Almost, op I mean, it's kind of obs just, just observations. Like she's not real. Like I mean, don't you feel like critical through those emotion. observations? She's she's criticizing her own sort of like basically like the literary middle class upper middle class community that he is the highly she's educated, definitely like basically she all of that nonsense does take some jabs at all of that but not in a i don't feel like she really fully associates with that she, stuff either she she doesn't explicitly uh, like she group does, herself she, into it no no she but i think she knows she's part of it right i think she definitely does she often more than once that i am aware of will slip into the third person plural Right. We mm. like we have like oftentimes like, oh, we have four drunks. We have five abortions, whatever that there's like this talking about like her, her, her cohort group or her generation, whatever it is. It's not exactly clear, but she does. See, that a I, couple of I times. always felt in reading it that it Especially was like when she's on the island. Oh, yeah. The island. That was the island. It was weird when she's on the island and talking about like the it's it's always like we do this. We are like I, this. I. I you're right, but 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 I agree with you, Nathan. I don't think. But it's, I felt like even then it was like she never really f quite belongs. Like even in her trying to write this book, I always feel like she doesn't. Yeah, you know, the, the author, the narrator, doesn't really belong in these groups. She's kind of seeing it happen, and it's because it's always like that's funny, that's weird. Like when she's flying the plane, it's like why is she flying the plane? She doesn't even know why she's flying the plane. She's just kind of like. Ended up flying the plane as this sort of, uh oh, we lost Nick. Just, it's okay. Just uh, keep recording, I guess. As this person kind of watching herself in this situation. Yeah. No, I, and I think, I think that's purposely done. The narrator is, that's why I asked at the beginning of the episode, do you feel like the narrator's character? Because it feels the narrator is even removed from her own life. It's like she's... Again, it feels like a diary that's not overly in-depth or emotional, which is it just kind of like touches on the surface of things that are happening without going too in-depth. And the passage that we keep going back to, that hostages pa passage, kind of alludes to her sort of talking around this idea of her being pregnant and possibly holding this man as a hostage or using the child as a hostage to negotiate the relationship. It never goes into that fully, but it just kind of hints at it and talks around it. And... It, it doesn't really do that as much in the rest of the book. It just kind of, it's literally just vignettes or anecdotes or overheard conversations that she is or is not a part of without ever really attaching herself to it. So I, I agree with you. I don't think it's very navel gazing mm -hmm. at all. Do you, I think it's very much a journalist's novel. Do you know people who seem to be mildly and inwardly bemused by everything that happens around them? That's kind of how the yeah. narrator feels to me ah so i just like it because it reminds me of myself <laughs> <laughs> that's it yeah <laughs> fair enough i do hate myself so it all <laughs> makes sense oh, there well, we explained it um another passage that i thought was funny uh what she's talking about it kind of starts serious 
There are times when every act, no matter how private or unconscious, becomes political. Whom you live with, how you wear your hair, whether you marry, whether you insist that your child take piano lessons, what are the brand names on your shelf? All these become political decisions. At other times, no act, no campaign, no track, statement, or rampage has any political charge at all. People with the least sense of which times are and which are not political are usually most avid about politics. At six one morning, Will went out in jeans and frayed sweater to buy a quart of milk. A tourist bus went by. The megaphone was directed at him. There's one, it said. That was in the 1960s. Ever since, he's wondered, there's one what? <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed <laughs> that. That was good. <laughs> so, if you're wondering why Nick hasn't chimed in, his power has gone out, according to this text message. I don't and know. Uh, he says we should just abruptly cut the episode in the middle, like her <laughs> flimsy <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Thanks for listening. As always, you can find us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance.